hello, listeners. Welcome back to the uh, Marine Corps Association Scuttlebutt Pos- Podcast. My name is William, and we have here uh, Vic. Hello. And unfortunately, Nick has been summoned by the higher powers of Marine Corps Association, but, uh, you know, wish him luck up there. He's but... here in spirit. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> So today is the second of our Amphibiosity series, and we have here our first reoccurring guest, Colonel Tim Howe, to go into... Era! Hey, hey, the bar is set Yeah, low. dude, where's the band, and man? Low, low bar. We like an applause track. Like a, <laughs> we right, do, right. we right. do. The Marine Corps Association is scrounging the yeah. gutters uh, if, if I'm the, uh, Whatever. the first if, reoccurring guest. If this were a video series, <laughs> we would definitely see the ticker tape parade as you're walking through the door. <laughs> but yeah, so we're just going to go, uh, go ahead and dive in. So, uh, Vic, you want to take it from here? Yeah. Hey, thanks um, again for joining us on this. This is um, just a continuation <laughs> of our last, um, our, our last, or our initial podcast um, episode dealing with amphibiosity. And um, hopefully this term is gaining some traction. Uh, it's... Um, Again, it's not a, a doctrinal term. It's not a, anything that you'll find in any dictionary. And uh, if you write it into a Word document, you're going to get the red squigglies. So far, though. So far, yeah. Stand by. <laughs> stand by for this to be, publica- to be a publication. But um, what we're really looking at is um, getting ahead of the rumor mill, um, you know, to bring truth to scuttlebutt. And really dive into what is it that the Marine Corps, uh, where are we going, what's our outlook, what's our, uh, our operational vision, our strategic, how do we nest with the uh, um, overall strategic plan, um, what is our value to the joint force. Um, and, you know, as we've talked about in the last episode, um, our amphibious roots is something, is a hook that we as Marines like to hang our hat on. But what we're going to deal, unpack in this series is, does that matter? And what does it really mean then to be amphibious? Um, With uh, Colonel Woodbridge, we talked about our expeditionary nature. We talked about a service defining capability, if that's even really a thing. Um, And then, yeah, what our value is to the joint force and et cetera, et cetera. And if you haven't listened to that, please go back. It's really, um, really engaging discussion. And uh, there's a, uh, it was a lot, I think, that we unpacked in a fairly short amount of time. Oh, yeah. Um, but, yeah, it was, it was really a pleasure to be a part of. So all that being said, we now have Colonel Tim Howe here with us. He is, um, as we stated, he was uh, in a previous episode. Please check that out. And you'll find out all things uh, that have to deal with acquisitions. But he is the, for those who didn't listen, he is the program manager for Advanced Amphibious Assault. Um, so, Colonel Howell, thank you so much for being here. Yeah, I appreciate it. Yeah, it's awesome. Um, so, for those um, who didn't listen to the uh, episode or are unfamiliar uh, with your body of work, um, <laughs> do you uh, would you mind just taking a little bit just to tell us who you are and, yeah. and where you're coming yeah, from? Yeah, real quick. Uh, it will make it quick. Um, so, uh, as we talked in the last uh, podcast, but for those who haven't haven't heard, obviously, uh, commission ninety eight, uh, graduated VMI, um, and. Uh, was fortunate enough to become a uh, assault amphibian vehicle officer. Um, <clears throat> did some time, you know, did a MU as a lieutenant, uh, and then was a company commander in OIF, uh, running alongside mobile uh, on mobile in our own AO, and then uh, came back with the OPSO a second tracks, and then uh, came to Quantico, uh, did some operational testing on the uh, the EFV. Um, and then really liked acquisitions and, and jumped in and, and have been doing that ever since. Nice. Yeah. Very good. Um, <laughs> and then just re- some real quick, so what were some of your more memorable tours? Yeah. Just as it applies to this amphibiosity. Yeah. I mean, I, I think uh, certainly, um, and, and, and I'm not saying this uh, to, to support this, this overall podcast, but anytime I think you get to deploy – uh, and do what you train to do um, are a memorable tour. So I, I would say there's there's three, um, and, and in this order, um, I would say as a company commander in combat, um, just watching what young kids volunteer to do um, 
was pretty profound and, and formative for me uh, as a captain, uh, as a, uh, a platoon commander uh, on the 22nd Mew uh, was certainly um, a memorable tour. I mean, just, you know, for a number of different reasons, but, you know, being out, going out into the world uh, and having a lot of responsibility as an AV platoon commander and, and seeing different countries and, and launching off the back of a ship, you know, in the dark of the night to land, you know, somewhere off of East Africa to go train is, uh, was, was, it was, I mean, lack of a better word, just pretty awesome. Yeah, um, for sure. You know, um, and, and, uh, and then finally, uh, you know, this current billet I'm in, notwithstanding, um, I was the program manager for infantry weapons. So just the opportunity to work with a great team of folks to uh, really modernize the, the infantry community and the close combat forces uh, for the first time. Uh, you know, in the last 20 years uh, was was pretty memorable. That's so. awesome. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think the perfect word for launching off the back of a ship yeah. is, is awesome. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think, and like we talked about in our in our previous conversation, it's like I get to surf in the Marine Corps. Like, yeah, how, yeah, I mean, right? this, this just doesn't – this is it. This is, this is it. Man. Yeah, this yeah. Is despite my, my want to be an Amtracker only because I got to be at the beach, uh, it turned <laughs> out to be uh, for a number – a host of different reasons uh, – uh, one of the best best choices I ever made. Was, Absolutely, was to, uh, me pick, as well. Uh, AAVs. And so you've gotten an opportunity to serve as a member of an expeditionary force, and then you spent a, so a good amount of time equipping that force and yeah. enabling this expeditionary culture that Colonel Woodbridge <clears throat> talked about in our last Amphibiosity mm-hmm. episode. Um, so from your perspective, seeing it in the trenches or, you know, in the well deck mm-hmm. and then seeing it then uh, from a acquisitions and procurement standpoint, when we start talking about the Marine Corps as an amphibious force, then what would you then say, is that the thing that separates us from being a second land army? Is it um, am- our amphibiosity that yeah, does that? Uh, I mean, I think, I think our ability, you know, historically and, and William, you, you know, keep me in my swim lane, right? Like, <laughs> um, you know, we have always been soldiers of the sea, right? So, um, it, you know, if you go look up the definition of, of Marine, you know, from the 1670s, you know, it borrowed from the French, it was soldier of the sea, right? Or, or uh, so, but does that define us as, as a service? I think it's certainly woven into our DNA that it's very hard to separate the two, right? Just by the very name Marine, uh, and, and, uh, you know, brings obviously images of, of going back to sea or going to the sea. And, and so I think what's hard, you know, after two decades of, of war in the desert is I think for our service to wrap our heads around like, hey, no, this is what we do. Um, but I don't think, <clears throat> I don't think our amphibiosity is what separates us it certainly helps because it's in our dna but i like we talked about before the start of the show is i think it's one our size right um if we're making a comparison strictly to the army i and this is tim howe's opinion uh certainly not the opinion of the marine corps association as, as you'll state <laughs> don't end. worry we'll put a disclaimer right at the end. right so. uh, <laughs> a big one you know is is you know one of the things that separates i think the marine corps from the army one is its size right so we're loyal to the service the army is typically from what I've seen, loyal to their unit. But that, yeah, right? So that size, though, provides us the opportunity to be agile. And and then with that, not only with that agility, our, our, our construct of operating within a MAGTAF where everything supports, uh, you know, that infantry unit as the base of maneuver um, provides the ability to be expeditionary, enables us to be amphibious, to integrate with, with the Navy on ship, to go forward because then, you know, you want to have unity of command with respect to all your enablers and who's in charge. Uh, but more importantly, you have all the tools that you need to go do whatever the nation is asking us to do, to be that force and readiness as it's, as it's called out in our Title 10, Title 10 mission. So I would say, does our amphibiosity, to make a, a long uh, answer shorter, uh, does it define us as a service? I think it's woven into our DNA. I don't think we should ever separate ourselves from the sea. Um, I think even in the, in the latest Commandant's birthday message, it says we must return to the sea. And I, I think that's exciting. Uh, but I think it's our, our, our size, our agility, uh, our construct around the MAGTAF that, that defines us as a service and what makes us attractive um, to the nation when we, you have to, uh, you know, deploy a service 
uh, that's always ready when the nation's least ready. And I know that's a bumper sticker. But For sure. But it's a good one. Sir, I, I yeah. think it, it rings true, right? So um, I'm not sure if that answered the question in that, you know, our amphibiosity, our amphibious nature certainly is woven into our DNA. But I don't think it defines us as a service as we've seen, uh, you know, over the past two decades. Yeah. Um, we've defined ourselves. We, we've defined our ability to do you know, whether it be counterinsurgency, we got really good at, right? Mm -hmm. um, but now we're transitioning. And, and ultimately, I think, you know, even from the days of Brute Krulak, who, you know, was sitting in Japan trying to figure out how we could create an LVT, and he's borrowing from the Japanese landing forces uh, when he was, I think, in China, right? Correct me if I'm wrong. And then, you know, that ability to innovate and then learn quickly um, that's what defines us as a service, is that innovative spirit um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that we've always had. So. Absolutely. Well, and, and I, I don't want to – I can't I can't speak for the Army um, and or the Navy, uh, but it seems as though they don't have – or at least and, – and obviously, William, you're here. Can we talk about how often it is that the Marine Corps comes into this part where we're having to define ourselves? I mean, it seems almost – as part of our DNA, also having to redefine. So should, I guess the question is, is that should we, is there a way to end that cycle? Should we always be in a position where we're having to define and redefine and deconstruct and reconstruct? Well, I think if you look like historically, I think a, a lot of historians have argued, like, who is the biggest, you know, supporter of the Marine Corps? It's not necessarily been the Congress or the Senate. It's, no. it's been the president because, you know, as the nation's force and readiness there, it's, you're easy. They're easy to deploy, it, and like whatever mission, essentially, the president wants them to use use them for, is is what they're going to be used for. So, to to I guess to answer your question, uh, it, it would be that it's essentially is it's going to need to change to to the circumstances. Okay. Yeah, I, and I think what <laughs> I and there's a you know we have to really parse out define versus defend, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. And and oftentimes those those intermingle, right? So, um, you know. I think every president um, since, you know, really since the 60s has, has recognized, I think, the Marine Corps. Certainly during World War II, the American public recognized it. But I don't think Truman was a big fan, nor was Eisenhower a fan of the Marine Corps. Hence, you know, National Security Act of 1947, and then, you know, it goes from there. Uh, but, but defining, I think, is also this constant redefining of what we do is important, right? Because I think when you get entrenched into one mode of how you do business, you A, don't see your blind spots, and mm, B, yep. you create a force that is not necessarily postured to one uh, rapidly transition to another another focus. It, it, you know, take the past two years, and I think this is what the Commandant talks about in, in – uh, he came out with an article, um, you know, talking about, um, you know, the, the why, basically, of force design. And, and, you know, and there's a lot of folks that are really questioning what he does with respect to, you know, divesting of tanks. How can you do that? How mm -hmm. can you divest? Mm -hmm. And then and put all your eggs in one basket focused on, on our pacing threat of China and, and, and completely ignore whether it be uh, non-state actors or, or you know, uh, Russia. Like, hey, how can you do that? But I think if you get so entrenched and believe that only we can solve the world's problems um, as a service within the DOD, then then you you create blind spots that set yourself up to fail and, and fail big. So I think we must always question and def our definition and and support to the country writ large, uh, uh, you know, in the context of what we provide to national security. Um, because otherwise, you know, you know, like I, you and I kind of were on the same arc, right? We came in, we were, we were agile, we were expeditionary. The Mew was the thing, right? And mm -hmm. it was, uh, and then we got entrenched into two decades of, of counterinsurgency, and things got heavier, things got bulkier, and and the way we operated was more kind of congruent to what a, a land army would do, right? Mm -hmm. It's natural. Mm -hmm. And so to come out of that and take a fresh look at, okay, where are we going? What are we doing? Yeah. Um, and we're going to wait our, our, our ability to conduct advanced base operations based upon the threat that we see rising, right? A precision strike regime that is expanding its naval capability to project power worldwide. Um, we have to now 
define what is our contribution to that. And, I, you know, I, I don't want to be cynical, but in, in some ways you have to define how you're relevant to the overall right. country because right. that relevance then equates to dollars. Right. Right. And so if you're not relevant, if you're not proving to Congress how you're going to provide for the overall security of this country, why are they going to give us any more money? Mm -hmm. You know, and, and I, I kind of make a joke that, you know, I've told some folks like the analogy is, uh, and, and again, you know, this is Tim Howe's opinion. We all pray to the Church of Chesty, right? And, and the Church of Chesty Puller is we all believe in this institution. Um, and I know I'm, I'm getting away from what we're talking about. But at the end of the day, um, we ha you have to pay into a church in order for it to thrive. Well, Congress has to pay into our church for mm -hmm. it to thrive. In order to make it thrive, we have to prove why our message is relevant. Right. And that relevance has to, has to be redefined. Because threats change, countries rise, you know, the focus of our security changes. And so by not doing so, I think you lock yourself into one. You become kind of like a, a one-trick pony. Yeah. And yeah. I think the Marine Corps has always prided itself on its innovativeness and ability to rapidly change. Yeah. And that's hard to do because no one likes change. Right. Um, you know, and, and uh, you know. So, no, I, yeah. I totally I, – I, I feel like – you know, whereas, you know, you know, be, being a badass is good for recruiting. <laughs> yeah. But it's not – it doesn't help when it comes time to – when someone asks, what do you provide to the joint force? Yeah. And you go, well, we're badass. Yeah, that's surface like, level, oh, right? Okay. <laughs> like, what what right. else you got? And so to that then, my fear when we start talking about, you know, this idea of soldiers from the sea – and is that enough? It's like, well, if you look at what the Army can provide and you look at what they have in their inventory, it's like, well, we could just do literally soldiers from the sea. They have that capability. Yeah. They, well, yeah. at least they have that equipment. And I think what Colonel Woodbridge talked about in the last episode that I have really uh, I thought was profound is, is that they may have the gear – but they don't necessarily have the culture. And I think what you're talking about this yeah. idea of DNA. <laughs> and so I just I wonder about that tension of always having to be flexible and to be introspective, but at the same time having a culture. Mm -hmm. And so yeah, how yeah. you know that that sort of <clears throat> that that push and pull there. And I think the tension is the demands to change to meet a threat is moves faster than the ability to change the course of, of the Titanic with respect to changing the culture. Right. Mm -hmm. So sometimes you have to weave that culture in and maintain that culture in order you don't get completely off the rails and have to like completely shift back. Um, I, I think he's absolutely right. And, you know, one of the questions that, that, you know, we had that I had that I, I kind of took notes on is like, you know, does the Marine Corps have to be an amphibious force? Can the, the Army do it? Yep. And I struggle writing these notes only in so much as that it's very hard for me to say no. Yeah. No, like it doesn't have to be the Marine Corps. And quite, quite, you know, honestly, when we talk about, you know, whether it be EABO or whatever, like the Marine Corps is just one facet of that whole thing. Like, right? yeah. like the Coast Guard can do some of this. Like the Navy can do some of this. The Air Force and Space Force. and then, So that's all just – we're just one tool in this whole thing. But <clears> – <throat> Does the amphibious force have to be a Marine Corps? And to your point, not. I, I think like last time I talked about like the data point I had is like the Army has more ships than yeah. than the Navy. Yeah. So right. You know now their capability and what they're designed to do may be slightly different, but but I mean what's hard for me to to, to say is right. Like, eh, it doesn't have to be a Marine Corps, right? But you know, and then we always go back to well, America wants its Marine Corps, and I still believe that to be true. Um, but to to your point, to what what Woody was saying is is. Why would you not use an institution that has the ability to rapidly change, to innovate, its size enables that, and it's in its DNA to do these type of operations, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and make no mistake, these are not just launching off the back of a ship. I think a lot of people have this misconception that amphibious operations is, you know, mech company launches off the back of the ship, lands at HR, moves inland – there's a lot that goes on, right? And and as was seen in Gallipoli, as was seen, uh, I think, during the Calabra maneuvers, like, if you don't backload the ship correctly, you're in a world of hurt. If you don't synchronize all the different enablers to 
support the focus of the overall missions in state, you're not going to pull it off. Mm -hmm. And that's very difficult when you're distanced by a great, you know, blue body of water. Right, right. However far that is. Yeah. So here's an interesting thing and another point, I guess, where we're talking tensions are when – and I, we'll obviously got to keep this low side. Um, mm-hmm. But we look at O plans. Yeah, You yeah. would say, hey, if I look at such and such O plan in a certain area, this – Need for an amphibious force is a critical piece within that O plan, especially when you start looking at like the first 90 days, 180 days. Mm-hmm. To that extent, then, all right, so that's on paper. Right. But as we've talked about a little bit here, you touched on a little bit already, is, is that for the past 20 years, we haven't been doing that. Right. And so now, obviously, Past commandants, current commandant are seeing that, hey, look, like I, uh, when I was still in uniform, it was this idea of getting back to core competencies. Right. Now Force Design 2030 is trying to do this paradigm shift, shift to realign, uh, you know, force lay down, how we treat our Marines, how we keep people mm-hmm. in uniform, what does our force need to look like, blah, blah, blah. So then my question is, we know on paper, here's the O plan. We look at how that is applied, though. I got to ask, and, and especially from you being in the acquisitions field, are we even still in the business of being amphibious? Or are we just repackaging our amphibiosity to, all, to, look, to kind of cover up the fact that we're still doing land-based operations? Yeah. <clears throat> no. I think I think again, right? What what is difficult for people to? There was a book I read. I think it's like, "We Need This War." I, I forget the exact title. I I gave it to someone. They gave it to someone else. I'm trying to get it back, right? <laughs> and there's, and a there's line, only one thief in the Marine Corps. Right, right, exactly. to get shit no, and it's a great book, right? And and it's it, it basically there's a line in there and says, it, you know, militaries can. It's hard for militaries to innovate or change on a dime, right? Like yep. it's very hard to do that. And so we've been, and I know we keep going back to this two decades of war, but we've been doing that for two decades, yeah, right? a long time. There's people who have served entire, like, careers and gotten out yeah. and know nothing but counterinsurgency, right? Right. And so then to make this rapid shift and you're, you know, there's no sacred cows or, you know, tanks can go. I mean, who would have thought we would have mm-hmm. divested the tanks, right? Like, but there was a time, you know. We, you know, that, that we didn't have those, right? And then they came and they, they went. And I know we're going to get into does a capability to define a service, but, <clears throat> and we're going to talk about that. But to answer your question, are we still, in a, you know, doing amphibious operation or an amphibious force? I, I think we haven't, right? Um, I think, you know, the Muse kind of got put on the back burner because everything was focused towards, uh, you know, supporting uh, OIF and OEF and then, and then other contingencies. But we're back, right? Mm-hmm. And we're mm-hmm. back to do it. And and looking at our pacing threat, looking at the geography of where we're going to be operating, we're back in the business, and business is going to be good, you <laughs> yeah. know. Like uh, yeah. so, uh, yeah, we chew bubble gum and land forces, and we're all out of bubble gum, right? Right, right, exactly. <laughs> so, so, d- but that doesn't mean we don't have a lot to learn, right? Similarly, when we went into Iraq and we started getting a counterinsurgency. People started digging up the small wars manual, right? Like, and so. Back to your cultures, how do you continue to maintain those learning lessons and not just shuck them off and forget them and then move forward? I, I think we can still do it because when you consider, you know, EABO or advanced space operations, depending upon what you're doing, because there is a difference, right? There's advanced mm-hmm. space operations and expeditionary advanced space operations, and one depends upon where you decide to set up that base and how long it's going to be there and the size of the unit. But you may, you know, you can still take the lessons that we've learned over two decades because we may be on an island have to deal with a local force that or a local populace that we have to engage and, and take the lessons from counterinsurgency in order to uh, get them to support what we're trying to do. You mm-hmm, know, mm-hmm. as Mal says, if you if you break the screen door, replace it. Right. So that type of mentality, you know, I, we go back to the land of hearts and minds. So I guess I go back to are we covering all this up uh, with amphibious your question? No, I don't think so. I think we are. It's a legitimate effort. It's a legitimate effort. I mean, you... you, It's not just a rebranding. No, I don't think so. And you can't... I mean, certainly there are parallels to what we saw in World War II, and William, correct me if I'm wrong, right? And, like, 
uh, you know, War Plan Orange or O Plan Orange, uh, you know, with respect to the island hopping campaign. And and then, you know, we can even go back to, um, you know, I, I mentioned it before, like the Calabra maneuvers. I mean, that, that was an advanced based operation. It's even called out. And so how they did that and some of the lessons learned there. So I don't think it's a rebranding. I think it's it's all in. And this is what we're doing, because you have to consider the pacing threat of China, mm-hmm. um, what they're doing. Right there. And, and again, I always tie the thread. This goes all the way back to like Alfred Thayer Mahan. Right. Like you want to talk about where a lot of this comes back to. And his his words still ring true. You know, he wrote um, his book in the 1890s. I think, um, you know, I think it's like Sea Power on History, 1680, whatever, to 17. I, You know, um, I've got it. But, it, yeah, the influence of Sea Power upon history, right? And so, but his whole contention was that, you know, the British Empire in order, and I'm going to get to the point of why this is so important, yeah, yeah. I think, overall from respect of amphibious operations and what we're doing, you know, his whole contention was, you know, the reason the British Empire expanded uh, as, a, as a country was because as a naval service, uh, you know, they had to have access to global commons, to marketplaces, because they couldn't absorb any more of the domestic uh, product they were producing. So they had to expand. So in order to do that, you had to have, you had to have one, a naval force, right? And then you had to have access to sea lines of communication. So where does that tie into today? Well, you have China that's a rising Mm-hmm. power mm-hmm. right they're expanding in the naval context if you look at their naval their shipbuilding they're expand they're building far faster than we are right um and, and we could talk quality and all that but they're obviously proving out that they have the means to to expand their reach globally uh within the naval construct and so where does that position the marine corps so the marine corps as it relates to whether it be force design or EABO, we must now provide a tool to the overall Joint Force Commander to understand the movements of the Chinese, uh, specifically their Navy, in order to maintain some of those sea lines communications so that we have access to the global commons, so that we have freedom of navigation throughout yeah. international waters. And, and what we're seeing is some of the threats that they're making is that they are going to have the ability to interdict our ability to move through some of those strategic lines of communication, whether it be the Straits of Malacca, mm-hmm. et cetera. And then on the other side of that is the Belt Road Initiative, right? So they're establishing ports. So they're going to deny our ability to get to, to key ports, possibly. They're establishing you know, inroads into other countries and promising a lot of economic growth. Right. And I think you and I have talked about this, right? Like, I don't we are postured obviously if, when it comes if there is a escalation on the conflict of continuum with the the chinese i think the marine corps and the rest of the country will be postured um i think it'll be a slugfest but i think economically it'll be fought first on economic terms mm. before we ever go to a military standoff and i think we're starting to see a lot of that right um, absolutely and, and how they're you know whether they're manipulating the the currency whether they're you know we got into a trade war um, and then, but they're getting their tentacles all over the earth. Uh, it, it, rare earths, right? You can talk about rare, rare earth uh, minerals mm-hmm. and the importance of that, and how they're locking down a lot of these mines on fifty-year leases that make it difficult, you know, for for these mines to do business with with uh, the U.S. So, all of this is to say is we have to get into the business of amphibious operations, because if we don't, we're leaving a huge gap or seam for the right, Chinese to right. just drive right through. So of all of the places, all of the belly buttons that would need to get pushed in order to maintain access. So it's about main, so it, maintaining an amphibious force, it matters because you have to maintain access. Yeah, and, I think so. And from the littorals, regardless of how, at some point, a physical matter like regardless of of the expansion of cyber and space at some point a physical thing has to go from point a to point b and that's usually over water yeah i mean there's no way around it right like the earth is covered by like 70 percent water i mean at some point we have to get there you can't rely on on you know air alone to get well, there. And especially as Chinese as the or as a, as a pacing threat, a near peer threat would be expanding its influence, mm-hmm. access is going to become more and more critical. Right. 
if we want to maintain, you know, again, like if you want to maintain freedom of navigation, if you want to maintain access to global global commons, you know, I mean, you look at what the Iranians do in the Straits of Hormuz. Yeah. Anytime they get close to trying to lock that thing down, it's red alert, right? Yeah. Because now that's access to uh, critical oil reserve, you know, yeah, oil right, supplies, right. or or just basic goods moving in and out of the Persian Gulf. So, you know, going back to Mahan's theory that you have to maintain, you know, strategic lines of communication. Uh, along that naval fleet, those become even more critical. So where does that position the Marine Corps, at least in Tim Howell's opinion, with respect to force design and EABO? We have to have the ability to deploy, whether it's advanced bases, to support naval sustainment, you know, over the horizon, you know, yeah, over yeah. the Pacific horizon. I'm talking big horizon, like along throughout the Pacific or wherever we may be at. And I know we're focused on the Pacific, but um, – you know, we have to have the ability to e- – and then deploy in an expeditionary manner in order to, you know, a- as the commandant calls it, you know, reconnaissance, counter-reconnaissance, or the naval concept. I think he calls out the – there's a famous historian named Hughes, uh, scouting and screening, right? And so scouting is collecting information, right? So that's what a small force would do, and that's what the Marine Corps is building itself towards, you know, with, with MLRs, Marine Littoral Regiments, and then the infantry battalion, and then what, what uh, a company would look like. Um, you know, they have to have the ability to deploy, collect on what's going on in the area, but also put our adversary, you know, we use horns of dilemma, put them in a position where they have to make a choice, right? Do I want to continue on that path? Because there may be someone sitting in an, you know, an EABO, an ex, uh, EAB rather, and has the ability then to go towards kind of like a screening to deny my ability to continue operating mm-hmm. as I wish, Right. And so and that can be in any number of ways. And, and again, capability doesn't doesn't define us who we are, but those capabilities are then enablers to help the overall in state of which, you know, the Marine Corps, you know, albeit at that smaller, whether you're you're an infantry battalion and you're conducting EABO or you're a stand in force like like we talked about earlier mm-hmm. to enable that stand in force and in the West to. Uh, conduct their operations to either collect on what the enemy is doing or adversary or deny their ability to operate. Right. Uh, because we are developing capabilities to do both. Yeah, so. yeah, absolutely. So then I would say then expeditionary mm. is where our culture well, – or being an expeditionary force – is what we've developed within our culture and within our DNA. Yeah. There's an aspect of that that is amphibious. Mm-hmm. I would say a critical aspect of that that is amphibious. Yeah. yeah. But does that mean, though, that the Marine Corps has to be an amphibious force? Um. So, for example, if we're talking EABO, we're talking um, you know, A2AD, a- anti-access area right. denial – could you establish a lodgement or could you establish a a sea base and then just not have Marines there? Would that work? Or does our expeditionary culture make us the critical piece to that to yeah, that, I mean, that, cert- to the execution yeah, portion? I mean, of that? certainly I think again, I go back to when you so again, I'll go back. Do you need a Marine Corps to do all this? No, I mean, I we could put SOCOM could do a lot of this, right? Like, yeah, uh, yeah, they could do that. Um, the army certainly could, but I think what you'll end up finding uh, is is and, and you know, of course, we're kind of in this middle ground between kind of SOCOM and the army with where we fit in the world, right? Middleweight. Yeah, yeah that, that kind of. But my point is, I think if you were to say, okay, army, we want you to go do expeditionary advanced based operations, and, and again, I'm clearly. I'm, I'm making a disparity between advanced space operations and expeditionary. Right. So, so let's just focus in on that with respect to where the Marine Corps would fit in. But, and of course, we would do advanced space operations as well. But from an expeditionary mindset, I think if you were to task the Army to do that, over time, that unit or those units that are doing it start to look more and more like the Marine Corps. Because you would, you know. Or do we exhaust their capability? Because one of the things we've talked about, and ACMAC hit on that in his uh, speech, was um, this idea, the expeditionary portion of it, meaning Mm -hmm. we're going to bring less stuff. Well, we're going to not embark 
a lot of these logistics things or um, uh, life sustainment things because we need more firepower. We need more lethality. Can the Army bring that level of lethality and sustain quality of life for their uh, Yeah, no, I think – well, and so this gets to your culture question, right? Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm leading The Marine Corps has always prided itself on just, like, suffering, right? Like like, (laughs) – We, I mean, like, we, we, the harder, the better. And I know that I'm, like, totally putting in a cliche and, like, but I don't, I think, like, you know, and again, I'm going to make a parallel to, you know, uh, whether, and I'm not going to call this a 300, but, like, you know, like, this notion, you know, of those that are Thermopylae, like, we're going to suffer and we know it. And that's what we're here for is to suffer, right? Um, I think that's what makes the Marine Corps break out from the army you know and again i don't want to disparage the army but they're characterized by large bulky iron mountains that they move in because they know they're going to be there a long time Mm -hmm. and i know like we've always prided ourselves that we're going to go in and kick in the door uh and then and then leave but i think in the case of of eabo part of that thread in in what i talked about it you know this notion of amphibiosity being in our dna part of that is our ability to go to shore Live ashore for as long as we can until the, until we're extracted and then and then go on to the next mission, right? And so I think there's a piece of that that's in our culture mm-hmm. that, you know, we're just gonna we're gonna go in and and we can endure that, um, because that's just what we do. Yeah, I makes me think about it. I think it was like a Terminal Lance uh, comic strip but it had like the four services yeah and like the first one was like you know the armies and you know the soldiers and a bad stress like that sucks and then they showed the various services saying you know this sucks this sucks and then they showed the marine corps in like this really awful situation and it was like i love that this sucks right i right. think that I just, as humorous as that was i think that there's there is something to that, that right. like yeah we take sort of a a weird there's a perverse like masochistic pride in the fact yeah. that this is awful and that's why we're here is because it's awful. Yeah. I mean and, and I mean obviously it's turned into kind of a joke, right? right. And but I think there is it, it is it is in who we are that we go do hard stuff. And not that the army doesn't do. I'm not like yeah, disparaging yeah, yeah, any yeah, other right. service. Every service has their own unique role in life and and they do great things. I think we're just so well suited for lighter mobile uh, more agile uh, type operations, and that that's what makes us yeah. so attractive, and that's why we're able, and we're task organized around. And I go yeah. back to the MagTap construct yep. that we're yep. able to go do that, right? And and you look at the army, typically characterized by big, heavy units. It um, takes them a while to go somewhere. Save you know, right. save some of their ranger regiments, right? But but those look more like. Marine Corps yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? You, you, you know, you could always argue like something like the eighty second, for example. Right. They're ready to go for right. sure. But is that what they should be doing? Right, right. Um, so yeah, no, that, that's good. That's great. So then, I guess when we look then, uh, and where you know we're definitely gonna lean heavy on your expertise is like this idea. Then okay, so if expeditionary our expeditionary culture is what separates us and what makes that's our value added to the joint force and there is an aspect of that a major aspect of that that is amphibious or at least it has the ability to operate within the littorals as a as a critical piece to that then we then look at what what do our doctrinal publications say about our amphibiosity you know mcdp1 says operating forces must be organized to provide forward deployed or rapidly deployable forces capable of conducting expeditionary operations in any environment. This means that in addition to maintaining their unique amphibious capability, the operating forces must maintain the capability to deploy by whatever means is appropriate to the situation. So then our equipment, our procurement, our acquisition cycle, what then, what are we doing? Are, are, are we positioning ourselves to continue to, to uh, enable a force that, that is meeting this doctrinal um, definition of an expeditionary amphibious force? Or are we still sort of stuck because of the 
glacial pace of acquisitions, <laughs> are we still stuck in this second in this land war mindset? Are we still equipping a force for a for a land war or for an irregular war, or are we making the shift holistically? towards yeah. uh, expeditionary yeah, yeah. amphibiosity. No, I think when the commandant divested of tanks, he put the stake in the ground yeah. and said, <laughs> yeah, that was we've moved shot. on, uh, you know, we're done. Um, certainly you're always going to need to there, – there's a balance, right, within defining – with developing uh, both requirements, which also lead to the, to the capability on the back end of – this notion of survivability. It was like we talked about, like after 20 years of war, our stuff just got heavier. Yeah, so there's actually been a lot of work on, you know, let's just take at a microcosm level at, at the individual plate carrier level. There's been a lot of work yeah, that no, that's actually, tr- yeah. when you weight a Marine, uh, they move slower and that now becomes less survivable on the battlefield, right? Um, because you can't move as fast. Mm-hmm. Um, so this tying this notion of, Weight to speed to survivability, um, whereas you know from you know realistically, O three to you know, twenty twenty one, it was characterized by okay, strap on the the, the sappy plates, weight them down because that is going to protect them from yeah, cover your neck, cover your groin, right? Cover that's like, going to protect yeah. them, right? And 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 so and, and there is there is merit to that to a point, as we move towards this new operating not i don't want to say new operating environment but to to a more uh you know an operating environment characterized by mobility low signature smaller forces um you know kind of within the the wes on island chains is there a need moving through the jungle does our kit support uh and i'm talking at the individual level does our kit support the ability to move efficiently and conduct operations in that, like in a jungle environment. There are, you know, cases to be made that maybe you don't wear a Kevlar in a jungle, right? Because mm-hmm. the fighting is so Yeah, close. I mean, and, look and at Predator. So, Those guys didn't have anybody. Right, right, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the, you know, and, and, and so the Marine Corps has done a very good job of giving that decision space to commanders on some of those. You know, when do you drop your, your gear set, uh, you know, with respect to sappies, scale up, scale down, and then, and then same, same with the, uh, you know, the helmet. At a grander scale, at your, your bigger, bigger programs, right? Um, well, let me go back. Globally, you know, the Marine Corps has always developed its capability to withstand the harsh environment of just salt water, right? Mm-hmm. So yeah. we test longer uh, with salt fog. There's a mill standard called 810G that defines the environmental standards. We do dunk testing to, I think it's uh, 66 feet, and then it must operate after that. Like So everything is geared towards this ability to operate within the context of uh, coming from Corrosion the control. Con- corrosion. Mm-hmm. Um, because it has to work when you come ashore, mm-hmm. right? Uh, whether you're a reconnaissance marine and you're diving coming in, whether you're an infantry marine coming off the back of an AAV, or you're a small crowd, you know, small boat yep. marine coming out of a, you know, y- y- it has to withstand the rigors of so- that that salt environment because of the corrosion, because of the, you know, just the w- the damage it can do. So all of our gear sets is, you know, whether from you know, B twenty two all the way down uh, is is baked into that. So. From the other aspect, from the bigger programs, um, you know, a, a lot, you know, whether it be V-22, ACV, I mean, I think some of that, it's hard to get away from some of the weight bogeys you're always going to have, right? Because you have this, you know, we, because of the, gla- the the pace at which it moves, right, to develop, let's take ACV, you know, that requirement was developed in 2015. Now I'm, I know people had an eye towards the future, but you still have the requirement to, for, to survive certain blasts. Survive certain blasts, right? Yeah. Whether it's an IED or an anti tank mine, you still got to survive it. So that drives some of your weight bogeys. Mm-hmm. But you can work within that construct to make it more mobile um, and, and, and maneuverable. But you, you can't just because it's always going to be he- just because it's heavier doesn't mean it's always a construct of the past but we d- you do learn from the past right right, right. having been a company commander in iraq you know we lost five aeds to to ieds you know those were not built for ieds mm-hmm. um, they just they were not built for that um and and it didn't have the the ground clearance it didn't have the the hole shape that it needed to to uh, deflect the energy so we learned from that and have incorporated into future ones but we still have the ability to deploy from L-class shipping 
wherever we want in the world, right? It, to conduct whether it be EABO or to conduct humanitarian assistance or NEO. Um, so I think the gear sets we have changed quickly, um, faster than, than I think we have ever seen in the acquisition community. We've been able to move very, very fast. I mean, there's a lot of good people over here at Hospital Point that are working hard to move equipment sets and, and change the focus of where we're going with them. So I think we have learned. I think we are moving quickly. Um, you know, everybody recognizes that ounces equals pounds, pounds equals misery. Whether you're wearing it, driving it, carrying it, it yeah. doesn't matter. Yeah, so. yeah. especially we're talking, you know, boat spacing is going to be at a premium. ACMAC talked about, you know, yeah. an endeavor, I guess, to even – have our own set of L-class ships. Yeah, and I didn't even touch about, you know, this this disparity, and I think we really saw it at the height of, of the past two decades of you are now waiting out before you're cubing out on a ship. So what that means is the ship can only take so much weight, and so if you're waiting out before you're cubing out uh, a ship, that means you have more space to put capability on there, but you can't because your gear set is too heavy. So right. – um, you know, I think there is, you know, those, I think, with, with ACV, uh, certainly a little bit heavier than the AAV. Um, but then, you know, you have other areas where, you know, now that we've gotten rid of tanks, tanks so you right. make up for that delta. You know, whatever that bogey was for four tanks on an L-class ship, um, you know, versus uh, you know, however, you know, the platoon. Well, you get more ACVs. LCAC sorties. Or L class, not L CAC. No, but, but yeah, you'll you open get up. less, yeah, you'll less L CAC So certainly. you can get more on the beach quicker because an entire <laughs> M1 was, that's right. one sortie. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, there's, there's puts and takes, right? Yeah. And so it constantly has to be monitored. Um, but I think certainly from an acquisition perspective, the, the Marine Corps has done a very good job of transitioning from two decades of war to focused wholly on, okay, how can we be a smaller, low signature, uh, more lethal force, um, you know, uh, whether mm -hmm. that be through what we're doing with, you know, cyber radios and, uh, you know, and then and then some of the other uh, precision strike, organic precision fires capabilities we're developing, um, we have transitioned very quickly. That's awesome because that actually led, leads right into my next question is is that, you know, the, the, the bright, shiny object right now is mm -hmm. cyber and space. Because mm -hmm. um, clearly, I mean, we've seen what maligning actors can do very easily mm -hmm. i mean all the way to the arab spring now that worked in our favor or at least our allies favor of their ability to use cyberspace to coordinate movements and rapidly trans uh you know tra uh, communicate and transition forces blah blah we saw on the other spectrum the russians in chimera and how uh, nefarious those cyber activities can be and how um unpredictable mm -hmm. um those sorts of things uh can manifest how they manifest themselves so all of that is a really long way of asking you then do you see our uh procurement strategy chasing that bright shiny object or is, are we looking at a more holistic approach so no that we're... i i no I, don't, I think you can't ignore it certainly right like to ignore Cyber in space uh, is a, a lonely, dark road wrought with walking off a cliff because <laughs> our adversaries are not ignoring it. Right. Um, you know, you talked about on, on the last, not on not on the one with Woody, but the one before that, the Force Design 2030 podcast, talking about this notion of cyber. And, and you, know, there is, you brought up a great point. There, there is no standard, at least there wasn't uh, a year and a half ago, for, you know, where cyber actions violate the law of war, right? And then... And then who do you hold accountable as it relates to sovereignty, right? Like, uh, then how do you make the just ad bellow the case for war and then the proportionality if you don't know where that came right, from, right? right? Because you could have someone sitting— Some bot farm somewhere. Someone sitting in Russia right. passing it through a server in Germany. Well, are you going to hold Germany accountable for, as mm. a sovereign nation? Okay, what's the case for war there? And then what's the proportionality? And so weaving that in. But the point I'm making is Russia and China, and I think Russia's— I, I, I think Russia does a better job than China as it relates to the cyber front. They're very good at it. I think we saw it. Um, it's part of the Grasimov Doctrine and in in, as it relates to, you know, this kind of gray zone warfare. And then China obviously does very good at it. Um, I, I think to ignore those two uh, domains 
um, you're, is wrought with peril. And so I don't think we're chasing the bright, shining object. I think actually we're trying to catch up uh, so that we can compete and then use those as tools to support whatever overall mission is going to be in support of the Joint Force Commander, right? So we're not, we're not, I guess what I meant by chasing the bright, shining object, we're not ignoring the other things that we are going to no, need to no, reshape. No, no I don't think okay. so at all. I mean, we're still obviously developing, well, we're developing and producing amphibious capability, whether, you know, they're looking at concepts of uh, uh, the law, the the light amphibious uh, ship, basically, for lack of a better word, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, whether we're looking at uh, precision strike weapons, we're still, you know, that are, that are uh, uh, low, sig- you know, or, or small in nature, uh, expeditionary, able to move in and out of, of island chains. Um, you know, obviously low signature is a focus. And then, um, you know, so so on that front, and then, you know, talking about comm links between all the different nodes that we're going to deploy. Um, so those are all still very relevant and all still being uh, focused on while we're trying to do all, you know, chase the cyber and, and catch up on that front as well as uh, in space. And, and again, we're talking about the Marine Corps. This is not a, like, EABO and, and what we're doing is not a unilateral. Right. And I say advanced space is not a unilateral Marine Corps mission. That is going to be supported by everybody. We are just a, a piece of the pie in that to yeah. help yeah. enable it. Yeah, that's a, I, I really appreciate you saying that because it's something as we do this redefining and this introspection – there does tend to be this myopic view that, like, well, what are we doing? How can we do all of this? And then we end up like right. just shoving more weight into that sack. And it's like, well, let's take a step back. Like, what is the jo- what are we doing for the joint force? Right. Because I think one of the things that we're seeing here is that any endeavor that is conducted unilaterally is doomed to fail because you yeah. just can't be in all these places physically and metaphysically in right. in cyber well and yeah and at quite, the same time i think it, one one thing amongst there's a lot of good things that came out of the past two decades you know is the this this you know, i think prior to you know oh well really september 11th and then ultimately oh three was this kind of I think, and, and again, I, I was I came in in '98. Was this kind of like okay, the Marine Corps is over here doing its thing with the Navy on the Muse, and then you know here's the Army kind of doing its thing over here, and the Air Force doing its thing. I think the product of two decades of war was we really fought as a joint force, right? Mm-hmm, and we mm-hmm. really evolved as a joint force to fight and integrate across uh, our service lines. And I think that is going to be to the benefit of us going forward because. I mean, let's be honest, like Space Force belongs in the Air Force. It, while the Marine Corps has a space component, mm-hmm. uh, little known fact, I didn't realize that, but we do have folks doing space stuff. Who does it best but Space Force? So mm-hmm. this notion that the Marine Corps is going to go in and, and you know do whatever we're going to be doing in space um, is, I think, naive, right? We're going to have to rely on working together in a joint fashion to enable what we want. You know, we're going to need something from the space uh, force within the space domain to get at what we want. Right. And, and similarly, you know, the Navy is going to need us to do things, uh, whether it be in an expeditionary advanced space or an advanced space, to enable their ability to sustain. And then, um, you know, uh, the Air Force writ large uh, certainly, uh, I think, does cyber pretty well. Uh, they've got a pretty big cyber component that I think – does better than we do now we're building a capability but to your point like this isn't going to be just the marine corps out there <clears throat> you know doing this alone right. we can't right we, we we just don't have the i don't think we have the we're not postured to do it right, right. And nor should we <clears throat> no absolutely I, the, my fear though and i i don't want to take this rabbit trail down too far but is that as we sort of dabble to maintain our mag taffery mm-hmm. Um, we, I guess for lack of a better term, we sort of half ass it because mm. we, like you were saying, like we just don't have the, the, the ass to do all these things at a level that they need to be done. But yet we, part of our culture is this idea of a task force. Like we have a, an ACE, we have mm. a GCE, we have, you know, uh, the comms, we have, 
Corman. We have, right. you know, we have all of these things that make up this task force, and they're all, for the most part, organic to what we do. And then we start throwing in the cyber piece, and all of a sudden you have, you know, cyber warriors or space specialists that are organic to your unit, but nobody knows how what to do with them. Yeah. So they yeah, just yeah. And sit up at the ant farm or they're in the COC uh, yeah. doing, you know, just basic rudimentary calm guy stuff right. or – you know, well, you know, I think that's a leadership. Fall into the I, I, I don't yeah. think okay. that's an institutional. I think that's a leadership issue, right? Okay. Like, anytime you get an enabler attached to your unit, you know, uh, poo poo on you for not understanding what they're bringing to the fight and how you can best use them, right? Like, yeah. Yeah. It, it, it would behoove you to understand that. Now, certain you mean, and that's where you, you know, that's a leadership issue. That, that's a fundamental leadership issue. Um, you know, and then ultimately, we talk about this this notion of I hope we're not half assing it, but like you first have to define who's the supported and the supporting and all this, right? And so whatever your mission, if you're the supporting, this is my slice of the pie. I think the Marine Corps has always done a pretty good job of, of going all in on that and trying to do the best we can. And, and it's certainly I'm biased on that, but yeah. I, I can't remember any time where we didn't, you know, on a, a global scale, we kind of half asked it, but you know, I don't mean as far as our execution. You know, like if I was, when I was a company commander, right? Like yeah. I had a, a data tech, I, we got from the battalion, uh, Corporal Dixon. Unfortunately, he got he got killed in Iraq. Uh, but the point I'm making is, like, this is like kind of the like oh seven. You know, you're setting up networks, and you know, and and I didn't. Uh, but you bring him like, hey man, how do you, what do you do? Like, I had a yeah. basic rudimentary concept of like networks, but not like he did. Right. So you and I'm not. I'm just giving you an example. No, that's good. I'm, yeah. say, I'm just saying, like, you as a leader, as a commander, have to understand what do you bring to bear. Right, and how can I best use you? And then let them tell you, and then you go from there, right? Mm-hmm. And in mm-hmm. development of your plans. So yeah, it, it certainly is challenging when they don't belong to you and you haven't dealt with them. I, and quite frankly, like I'm going to be honest, I, don't, I would have short of having someone for, like I wouldn't know what to do with a space force person, but I would have to ask him. But I could, I would think, hey, hmm, you could probably control like. Satellites and stuff, I would think, right? Like, yeah. how can that help me? You can control imagery. Like, you can – what can you pull down for me from uh, a, an intelligence perspective yeah. that I can start tracking movements yeah, within you have my access assigned to that I area? Don't. Right. Yeah. yeah. So, like, how can you build my situational awareness? And then how can you ultimately help me win uh, yeah. in my overall uh, – whatever my final result desired is, right? And yeah. so um, – you know, the other thing we talked about, too, and talking about acquisitions and, and, and we have to be cognizant of is the coins of the realm and what we're about to, you know, we're getting ready to do is, is, is reliability and sustainability, right? Like, so <clears throat> our gear sets must be reliable. You know, I, when I go out to my car and I hit the button, it turns on. Mm-hmm. I never think twice about that, right? right? Nobody does. And, well, my last old minivan I did, right? Hence <laughs> yeah, why I got a new car. But, you know, there was a time I didn't. But the point I'm making is, is you hit that button, you know it's going to come on. Our gear should operate the same way. Because you are going to be, you know, a, a, in my head, you're going to have a company somewhere within the, the WES, right? The Weapon Engagement Zone as a stand-in force. They can't be worrying about whether their gear is going right, to work. Right. Right? You have to have a high reliability Pers- you know, hours, right? Like, and so we define it by mean time between operation and mission failure, but that's defined in hours. That has to be high because it has to work every time because you don't have the back end support right. to help get that fixed, right? <clears throat> and and then trying to get a sort of, you know, trying to get an LCAC or whatever to lift it back if you can't, let's just take the ACB in, in this context to, to swim it back. The other thing is sustainability, right? Like, so we all know technology is getting more and more complex. But it can't be on the backs of Marines sitting in some island in the middle of the Pacific, and they're trying to, like, look at this. Because you may not have that critical enabler, you know, whether it be electro-optic repair Marine um, or, or what have you, that they don't have time to look at it and go, okay, I need, like, these list of tools to fuse, to route, to whatever. Yeah. In my mind, it has to be kind of modular and plug and play. Okay, pull out that card, throw in another one, we're back up and running. Yeah. So – while technology is getting more and more complex, we as a service, I think, have to make sure that our focus uh, going forward is high reliability as a mandatory minimum, right? 
uh, and and then this notion of it has to be sustained in a kind of modular plug and play uh, with as minimal parts as necessary uh, because you know this this vast network to sustain uh, the force logistically is going to be I, I you know I know Lieutenant General Schrodi is now the CEO like minds like that to figure this out I, I can't even I can't even yeah. wrap my head around it so. And, and we have to be integrated with the Navy's logistics system, which I don't know that we are right now. So that's another area I right. think we need to integrate. No, that's a good point. Because because how are we going to get you – know, we'll have our little Iron Mountain over here. Let's just – I don't know. It's in some country. We've got some on the ship. How are those two resupplying, right? Mm-hmm. I, right now we just do unreps, right? Right. Uh, but how can you make that faster? And then how do you get that the final 400 yards to wherever they're at on you know in an yeah. island without giving away the position of that hub that that uh. EABO you know their, that EAB rather? Mm-hmm. So that certainly is going to have to be um, that is I think going to be a a challenge. I know they're tackling it right. I know there's a lot of folks working on it right now. And then you know certainly they're all, they're all talking about like this this. Uh, Foraging, foraging. Yeah, so I was going to get into that. Yeah. So do you see within our procurement, and, and I'm just going to make stuff up because I have no idea what right. we're ta- talking about, the procurement cycle for foraging, <laughs> which seems almost counterintuitive. But at the same time, I mean, you, I can't just like wish – the sun to power my generator. There's got to be a procurement cycle that's going Mm -hmm. to allow, there's got to be an equipment set that allows for that to happen. Like good intentions aren't going, like if I don't pack enough fuel to power my generators, good intentions aren't going to turn that thing on. So there's got, so do you see an environmental, an effort towards environmentally focused procurement that allows these EABs to be self-sustaining? So I'm not the smartest person on this, but I do know, you know, we've had expeditionary uh, power. Uh, there's a PM at Syscom that's been working at this for a long time, right? Uh, whether it's through solar panels or, you know, smaller generators, um, et cetera, et cetera, and how you power those on. Um, certainly there needs to be a big push, and I'm, I'm sure they're working. Again, I'm not the smartest guy on this. Uh, and, but and there I, is a program manager that's Yeah, that looks at, at expeditionary power and how you do that, right? And, and, and then there's folks that work on, you know, water capture, right? And I know there's some, like, far-out technologies of, like, capturing, you know, uh, water from the atmosphere. But, like, that stuff's far out. But, I mean, you talk at the rudimentary level of foraging. I mean, like – Napoleon went into Russia and outran his supply lines. And, yeah, yeah. You know, I, I'm sure they started just killing horses, right? Because yeah. You got to find food and you got to feed folks. At, yeah. at the, you know, Maslow's hierarchy needs. People are going to start figuring out how to feed themselves. But, you know. And we've also seen that, like, combat readiness degrades absolutely significantly. Absolutely So that yeah. is a huge component of, okay, we get ashore. How do we, A, resupply us? And if we can't resupply us, how do we – extend the time between resupply by living off the land. And right. It, that is something I think is interesting to me. I was watching it. Actually, I was watching a video on it yesterday. Uh, just, uh, I think it's on the Marines uh, website and, and, and what they're teaching at TBS on how to, you know, how to clean fish, how to clean pig, you know, stuff that if you've grown up in the country, you kind of know how to do, right? Like you've grown up doing it, but there's, it's, there's a host of people that right. never learned how to do that. So sure. I think that's critical in the sense that okay, you're you're on an uh, a you know a body of land that's surrounded by water. You better know how to capture and kill your own food in order to sustain. Now, um, I, I again, I'm not the smartest guy, but I think yeah. that's a, that is a fascinating uh, area as it relates to the overall movement towards. Uh, you know, advanced-based operation, stand-in force. Well, even if something is rudimentary or is is automatic, is like an uh, – what is it? The, the – what are they calling the Mojave Vipers now? The, the MRX or MWX? Or oh, the, or yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, but basically maneuver warfare out in 29 Palms. Right. Doing a sustained uh, exercise out there. Just look at, like, all of the – Seven tons and mm-hmm. that yeah. just are packed with MREs, right? And that's just to, to get them through thirty days in twenty nine yeah. palms. Yeah, like boxes how, and boxes of how, how many boxes of MREs was in the hull of each of your vehicles when you were in Europe? One commander? more, 
Right, right. <laughs> Always one more, right? Like, I remember when we gave up our platoon of tracks when I was a lieutenant to Iron. Was it Iron or is it, it – we had straight legs going back to the Ram RS program. I think out of, like – the 12 vehicles I had as platoon commander, we pulled out like 24 cases. It was like two per <laughs> because every platoon sergeant shoved another yeah, case yeah. into the football field of the track because you never knew yeah. when you were going to be left high and dry. And no gunny wanted to leave his Marines high and dry. Yeah. You know? So, and I mean, so, that idea then of foraging um, is really, I, I find it all, I also find it pretty fascinating because of this idea that, like, yeah. We're gonna live off the land, but what does that look like? And how do you yeah. even how do you do preservation? Right. Yeah. I, I don't know. It, it is fascinating to me. You know, it, again, I I don't think it's like the. I'm certain it's not like the the strategy. Like, all right, studs take two dos of of you know. <laughs> Uh, you know, of MREs, field strip them, and then uh, we'll see you in a month. Hopefully you catch enough fish. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah. Like, I know that's not the plan. I think it's used like, okay, we want to be low signature. We want to be mobile. We want to be a small force that's able to move quickly. And we can't, you know, we, we're not going to be able to resupply you. Like, if we can't get you to re- – we can't resupply you when we want because of whatever. Conditions change. The adversary's out there. We don't well, want to so give away your position. Give away your position. Yeah, right. more ships that are coming in and out to that place. Uh, right. Like, I guess there's something there. Then, then you're going to have to rely on yourselves. Mm-hmm. And, I mean, and I, I think that's a critical skill that, that every Marine – you know, the other piece to that, too, and talking about this notion of resupply is, you know, <laughs> batteries, right? Like, yeah. Like, all of our stuff is powered by batteries. And, and, and lithium ion is you – know, alkaline battery is not going to charge your 31 alpha yeah, dual, right. dual tube nods for long. Lithium ion will. Unfortunately, those rares are getting kind of bought up by the Chinese, so that's kind of a concern. But y- – we have to get technology. I know Syscom's looking at it along with the Army of how can we extend the battery length, right? Because that then ties back to, you know, your ability to resupply and sustain. Generators. So, yeah, and, I mean, all of that. All just power. I mean, like in the EW spectrum, I mean, it just glows. Right, and so that's the other that. thing, yeah. too, right? How do we operate within this e- – that's something we haven't talked about, but how do we operate in this EW spectrum of low signature but still be as capable? You know, and, and I know uh, – they're working on that right now. The you know McWill's working on it with experimentation. How do you do all this right? Uh, not only with with data, with you know the the wealth of computers we're pulling in. Um, you know how do you do that? Is it a switch on, switch off? Do you how do you and then how do you deceive? Right? Can you make it look bigger than it is? Mm-hmm. You know mm-hmm. all of that stuff. I mean, there's still some kind of basic tenets of you know fooling the enemy and and, and doing that. And, yeah, and, yeah, feints and dis- right. uh, we haven't even talked bandwidth yet. Uh, yeah, my friend. Which you said, did. You talked bandwidth yeah, yeah, in a Gazette article yeah, yeah, back yeah, yeah, in yeah. August. Yep, for yeah. anybody who wants to go back and take yeah, a read. Yeah, that you know, I had a friend of mine tell me this back in EWS. Um, you know, he he was a, a com commo, and he actually became the RCT commo for the RCT I was supporting in Iraq as a company commander. And, you know, he's like, you know, this whole thing about like. Amateurs talk tactics. Professionals talk logistics. He's like, professionals don't talk logistics anymore. And this was like back in 05. So like how prescient this guy was like, how like smart. He's like, professionals talk bandwidth. And I was like, yeah, dude, that sounds cool. Like I just came like, <laughs> yeah, 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 right? Yeah. You know, like like typical so like true. knuckle so drag. True. I was like, yeah, that's what I think too. Like not fully understanding what he's talking about, right? Like a- as I sat there with my flip phone and had no concept of anything. And But then when you start thinking about it, it's like, Okay, you're going to be on an island in the middle of the WES as a stand-in force on an expeditionary advance base. You have to pass data, right? Somehow you have to get data in order to update your situation. You have to update the joint force or the naval force with your situation. How much mud can you shove through a straw, (laughs) right? Like you've got a five-pound straw, but you got 10 pounds of mud. you got to jam through that thing, and, and, you know— that is a real challenge, um, and so that's something that really needs to be considered amongst all the other challenges. And then, to what, and I think even from a leadership standpoint, so that idea is senior leaders are going to have to get used to not knowing everything all the time. Right. I mean, how much of a challenge? I think that's why. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, all the, like you would you would have. You know, task force commanders able to reach down to at the squad level. Yeah, so I, and, it, that's going to be a paradigm shift, right? Yeah. Like getting back to this notion of you don't know everything that's going on. 
I am ashamed. I was one of those those commanders. So as a company commander, I'm watching this OJ Simpson like chase of an Amtrak on MSR Mobile. I'm watching it through uh, a Predator yeah. feed. Yeah. And I'm talking to now a Mass Sergeant who works for me uh, on our net team. And God bless him. He was a sergeant then. I'm like, there's the car. Go left. Go right. Go left. Go right. And he finally just comes off the over the net, the company tack, and basically it was like, hey, you know, Captain, shut the F up. Like, <laughs> I'm trying to do my job here. And it was the biggest learning lesson for me because I knew intuitively I shouldn't have been doing it, but you get caught up in wanting to control. Yeah. Like, Every leader wants to be able to control. And, and so giving up that control, to your point, and not knowing everything, and this gets back to the talent management piece and where we're going with with our infantry battalions and making them more mature, older forces, we have to trust that our force on an island, and I keep saying island, but whatever, yeah, in, in the middle of in the Pacific, EAB, yeah. has the maturity to make a decision, and I as a commander am okay with that happening. They'll get back to me you know, to update me with a, a sit rep when, to, they can. W- when they can or, or when, when it's predetermined. Now, certainly there's going to be some decisions that can't be made by, by a company commander, you know, like right. launching some precision strike weapons is not going to be at the hands of a, of a It'd be pretty cool, <laughs> but <you know. laughs> just, we all dreamed about that. <laughs> right. Right. But, but certainly, you know, you, you make a great point. That is going to be a big shift is that you're not going to be able to reach down and control what's going and going on. Yeah, at the at the at the grassroots level, that could have you know talk about uh, strategic corporal. <laughs> yeah, like this could really get to be well, especially if a commander of an entire MLR, mm-hmm. which would I would imagine have multiple EABs within mm-hmm. their AO. Yeah, you can't clog that bandwidth no. by trying to reach down to the at the squad level every time because what if something happens? Right. Or what happens oh. if all of the islands and, at and, the same and time? And oh, by the way, from an EW perspective, you wouldn't want to. Right. You wouldn't want to right. be flipped on all the time. Yeah, yeah. Unless you're trying to deceive that there's a bigger force. But, I mean, think about the span of distance. You yeah. as an MLR commander, it's going to try to control. Yeah, because every time you open up, you will uh, you make yourself vulnerable to seepage like or that. fishing or whatever. Well, not only Some that, just crazy just they, malware. They can target you. Yeah, yeah, and, target, and yeah. as a right, as their precision strike game is varsity level, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, I think we just saw what was reported in the news recently that their hypersonic, hypersonic missile yeah. shot another missile out of the, the hypersonic. Like it's you know it's it, it's uh, it's kind of like Alien, you know, where the little head came out of the big yeah, head. But the right. point is, it's like. Their precision game, str- game, precision strike game is is very, very. I don't know how mature, but it's good. Yeah, I think we're we're trying to catch up in the hypersonic realm, at least from open source that I know of. I, I mm-hmm. don't know anything, but the point I'm making is, is as soon as you expose yourself, you're opening yourself up for becoming a target quickly. So you don't want to, con- as a commander, constantly reach down there. So you got to figure out, you know, when when the lights are on and when the lights yeah. are off. Need to start looking into carrier pigeons. I think that's yeah, I think right. what, what was old is now new, man. Are you remember those mine hunting dolphins? Like, the, <laughs> yes. like I've ever seen them at Del Mar. I was like, that's the coolest thing I've ever seen. Well, uh, Colonel Hal, thank you so much um, for your you know being so generous with your time this morning. Um, yeah, I think what we've talked about here is, I, I think I, I at least I like to hear from these experts about where our mindset is. And yes, there's not going to be a panacea. Clearly, there's mm-hmm. too many pokers in the fire for there to be a single solution right. to not only at the strategic level, but even at the tactical level. There's just a lot going on. But it looks like, and it seems like, at least from the procurement side, that we are aware of the problem. And that's like the first step, is at least being humble enough to admit right. that that things in, that need to need to change, and that we need to make these shifts in a timely fashion. Yeah, and I think uh, you know. To, and I, first of all, I appreciate you having me, William. Thank you. Uh, uh, you know, I, I, and and Vic, I appreciate you having me on. Like again, I, I I go back to one a. I'm not an expert, and b. You, you're scraping pretty low uh, <laughs> if I'm your first recurring guest, but. The, the point is, is like, you know, we, I think, are at this kind of inflection point in the Marine Corps where we need to shuck off the past and focus on what's coming in the future. And the future is is a rising China. And so we have to be aligned to that while still balancing uh, other, uh, 
you know, other threats called out in the national defense strategy. So from, from a, you know, doctrinal standpoint, I know McWill is doing a lot of war gaming. Uh, you know, they're standing up the war gaming center over here, which I think is going to be uh, phenomenal to, to, you know, get a lot of reps and sets with respect to how, where we're going, what we're doing. And then ultimately how our gear set and capability development supports uh, yeah. those war games. Uh, but from the acquisition perspective, uh, you know, a lot of people are focused on moving moving out and moving quick to enable and support this renewed focus. And that's across the breadth of of uh, capability, whether it be cyber, whether it be, you know, ACV, whether it be precision strike, organic precision fires, expeditionary power. Uh, we're moving quick. Um, and and I, I'll go back to what we originally talked about, right? Like, all this requires money. It's not about money. It's all about the money. <laughs> right. And if you want to get the money, you have to tell your story. And I think we as a service are telling our story. Um, and, and I think Congress is starting to understand it. Um, but all of that, all of what we're doing would be for naught without the money. Um, and, and that money is only given based upon Congress's and the country's belief on our relevance and what we're about to go do. So – to kind of tie a bow on all this is we are providing, you know, our services relevance to the future fight is our ability to be expeditionary, uh, conduct advanced based operations. Um, and that's all rooted in, you know, one, our, our culture, our DNA, uh, our ability to deploy in an expeditionary manner integrated with our naval, uh, our naval service, um, as well as integrate with the joint force that we've been working with for a long time. You know what we're doing is not a unilateral effort, um, and then and then uh, you know ultimately, um, I think what we provide and that it, what we're telling our story is how we provide that relevance uh, will help shape shape the future for 2030 when we finally you know when this is all going to come to fruition. Yeah, once the dust settles. Yeah. Awesome. Well, sir, thank you so much for being here. This was awesome. Yeah, I appreciate and, it. And. Uh, yeah, we'll uh, look to see if maybe you're our, our first Third, reoccurring, reoccurring, re reoccurring, yeah. reoccurring guest. <laughs> yeah. at, at which point, I'm not sure what we talk about. Then we can, uh, yeah, we can talk about my woes on the CFT. We can talk about yeah, uh, living on the West Coast, <laughs> right. living on the East you know, Coast. Yeah, you, you, I'll let you talk West Coast. I always wanted to, but I was always the East Coast guy. So uh, hey, you went for a, you you texted me when you were going for a run along the beach. Yeah, so that's you made true. me nice and jealous. That yeah, still yeah. hurts my heart, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> so. Every time I'm out there, I'll have to let you know. So, oh, man. Uh, I'll, uh, I'll that, go to Del Taco Just for know you. I'll be crying every time you hit send. <laughs> I'll eat a breakfast burrito from Del Taco for you. Oh, <laughs> beautiful. All right. Well, uh, uh, guests, thank you again for uh, listening to our second episode of uh, Amphibiosity. Uh, and like I said, we brought up a lot of uh, important questions and issues. So please feel free to write, um, send in, respond to anything we said. And the only way we can really improve the Marine Corps is through your ideas and writing. So please, like I said, uh, Gazette, Leatherneck, all of us, we're looking for your ideas. Um, thank you again. The uh, Marine Corps Association uh, podcast Scuttlebutt is brought to you by uh, myself, William, Vic, and then with uh, contributions from uh, Nancy Lichman and Nick. And remember that this is Scuttlebutt. These ideas are our own, our opinions are our own, and does not necessarily reflect the Marine Corps Association, DOD, or Marine Corps. Have a good one, y'all. Bye.